Good morning, everybody. Welcome to the uh, Virginia Museum of Fine Arts 3 and 30, American Land, American People. My name is Kristen Long, and I actually work for the Tour Services Department at the museum, and I'm here to introduce today's speaker. Today's speaker is Dr. Joanna Minnick. She is the Assistant Curator for Native American Art here at the museum, and I'm going to step back and let her start. Thank you. Thank you, Kristen. And thank you guys for showing up today. I have um, some new things that have occurred in the American galleries. And so I wanted to spend my 30 minutes with you guys talking about what you can see now in um, one of the American galleries as we um, began this project about a year ago. Really the concept of it began closer to two years ago. <clears throat> but over the past year, we began to incorporate Native American works into the American galleries. And we did this mainly because we did see that there are um, obvious gaps in the history and the narrative and we really wanted to focus on giving visitors a more complete story of the history of America. And so this came about mainly with um, one of the, the key inspirations was this gift that I'm sure most of you are aware of this incredible gift of Asher Duran's progress painting. Um, so it, this is to help also orient you to the gallery that we're discussing. So if you ask any of the associates in the galleries where this painting is, they'll definitely be able to direct you to where it is. Um, Asher Duran's progress painted in 1853 really epitomizes the, um, the, the general feeling of European Americans about what it meant to be an American and, and more um, specifically what it means to occupy this new, what they considered kind of an unspoiled wilderness. And so in my mind, one of the, the biggest polarities in um, philosophy between Native Americans and European Americans was this concept of land, of land ownership, of the use of resources, of the value of connecting to a specific place. And in particular, the way in which Native people have connected um, forever to these places that they called home, whereas the European Americans had uh, a much different concept because they were obviously arriving from other parts of the world and they were keen to explore and conquer and um, appropriate all of the resources that they could. So obviously these two philosophies are going to be in direct conflict with one another. So I wanted to incorporate not just historic works of Native American art, but I also wanted to bring home to visitors the idea that um, Native people obviously still are very much a part of our society. They are still creating art. They are still telling their stories. And I wanted to do away with this myth that Native history ended with the 19th century. So we're trying to kind of flesh out what was happening contemporaneous to Asher Durand and his, his contemporaries but also what has happened since and how those stories have passed through um, Native generations as well. So the, the work that I selected to kind of um, converse most directly with Asha Duran's progress painting was Joan Quick to see Smith, and this is her war-torn dress. And I would invite you to go in and, and read the label to get more information about why I chose this one, but specifically it has to do with this whole notion of Native presence. And so in Asher Duran's painting, we have the native people reduced to these tiny figures in the lower left corner, whereas in Joan Quick to see Smith's painting, you have the native presence front and center because it is very clearly uh, a kind of iconic native dress form, and yet you're immediately confronted with the absence of a human body actually occupying the dress. And so that really calls into question where has that native person gone? What has become of the native body, the native person? And so that kind of sparks this conversation um, directly with Asha Duran's um, notion of, of the kinds of spaces that native people occupy. More specifically though, I wanted to focus on the works that have just recently, as in last week, um, been installed into the gallery. And these are two works by Virgil Ortiz. He's a Cochiti Pueblo potter. And he is, um, a, a contemporary, obviously a very contemporary artist. I, I didn't, I, I should preface that by saying if somebody has questions about the concept, um, they're free to ask in the, in the chat and Kristen will let me know if you have questions about that so far. So um, be sure and do that. It's much more of a discussion than a lecture, hopefully. And um, so we'll move on to Virgil. Virgil Ortiz is um, 
inspired by a lot of the traditions of the generations of Cochiti potters that came before him. Cochiti Pueblo potters were known more specifically for their human figures than they were for their vessel forms. And they often crafted these large scale human figures to um, kind of a, as a social commentary. So they were referred to as Munoz or clown figures. And they were basically this kind of satirical take on all of the new types of people and cultures that they were being exposed to in the Southwest as the trains uh, began to make their way all the way out to Santa Fe. More and more people as tourists were, were arriving out into the Southwest to purchase um, Native American art, to take pictures, to paint, to engage with these new, what they considered sort of quote unquote exotic cultures. And it was not just white European tourists that were arriving, but um, Chinese immigrants were heavily populating the Southwest. Um, they had all kinds of musical acts, circus acts that were arriving to entertain these new settlements and new populations. And so native people were very um, keen observers of what was going on around them. And so they, they created these large scale figures. Virgil Ortiz is doing the same thing with Stu and Cuda, and yet he is attempting to regenerate interest specifically in Pueblo history and um, specific events such as the Pueblo Revolt of 1680. That was the point at which Pueblo people were able to expel the Spanish. They were able to, to run them all the way back into the wilds of Texas for about a dozen years. And this was a real point of pride for um, the Pueblo people. And Virgil realized that not a lot of his contemporaries and particularly his nieces and nephews didn't really know that much about that history. They were being taught you know, American history in schools and it didn't include their own history. And um, he also remembered from his own um, adolescence his fascination with Star Wars and science fiction narratives. And so he created this whole narrative based on Pueblo history, but has this kind of sci-fi undertone. And so Stu and Kuda are two of the characters in this narrative. He turned it into an entire screenplay. And so he imagines it as a feature film. And Stu and Kuda are these androgynous time traveling twins that occupied the mesas back in ancient time and then took off in these spaceships. And that explains why the mesas are flat on top. So we have this connection to specific points in the landscape, but it was also a way to engage his, his niece and nephew and their friends in this um, fascination with Pueblo history. And so he's, he's engaging them with these exciting narratives, but he's also attaching himself very strongly to tradition because he does use the same exact techniques. He digs the clay from the same source. He harvests the wild spinach, boils it down, um, creates the pigments for his figures, and he, he fires these in um, a pit kiln outside his house, out in his yard. So he's using all of those traditional methods, all of the traditional formats, but he's creating something that's exciting, that attaches um, himself to both the, the present, the future, and the past. <clears throat> now, the Sierra Miwok basket that I have is, um, as if you'll go into the gallery, you will see a Thomas Moran painting of the Yosemite Valley and a waterfall with this um, rainbow. It's a very um, sort of iconic view of that particular falls. And I chose this work because the Sierra Miwok people were those uh, peoples that were expelled from that area as European Americans came in and began to extract resources and um, kind of settle in those areas as well. And so a lot of what you'll see with those landscape paintings, specifically in that gallery, is this very romanticized notion of America as this unspoiled wilderness that has yet to be discovered by anyone. And, and it was very uh, conscious, conscious of the, the, the artist to not really include any native presence with the exception of these tiny figures in the progress painting. Typically what you'll see is this notion of the land is here for the taking. And so we aren't often confronted or asked to consider the presence of people that were there prior. And so this basket, I think really um, forces people to think there are actually people that occupy these spaces. And I think for the baskets and things like pottery, but specifically this basket, this is something that I think is a very literal weaving together of man and nature. So if you, if you look at enough baskets, you tend to kind of recognize the particular types of fiber you can, um, and I certainly haven't looked at enough to, 
to automatically recognize that as such. But you know, the, the materials that they use are very specific to the area that they occupy. So that, in a sense, ties that artist to that particular place in the landscape. The motifs chosen are very specific to a community or even a member within that community. So I think that this becomes this really beautiful metaphor of the literal weaving together of man and nature, because you have these very natural materials that are exploited and then reformed and created something completely new that would not have occurred in nature without human presence. And so as subtle as it is, it's also a very specific reminder that, that people lived there. Um, the thing I like about these baskets and some of the pottery as well is that one of my missions as curator is to include a lot more women artists in our collection because that's been a, a goal of mine for a long time. And I think with um, Native American art, it becomes a much simpler task because so many of these early prehistoric and historic 19th century artists were women. I mean, it, it was definitely the purview of women to create all of these beautiful but functional objects. And so I think that for me, it also kind of inserts a, a female presence. And, and what you'll see is that I have a pretty equal balance of, of female and male artists in this particular gallery space, but all of the, the landscape painters are male. So I've, I've definitely kind of inserted the female, the feminine presence um, into this gallery as well. And, and obviously of course with Joan, quick to see Smith and her dress as well. This is another piece that's in the same case as the basket. This is a small cornmeal bowl by Eileen Yatsati, and she's a Zuni um, ceramicist. And this one I like because similar to the basket and, and really with the Virgil Ortiz pieces too, you are reminded of this um, very human presence in the land. And, and she is practicing all of the same traditional methods of acquiring the clay and creating the natural slips. I think she might use an electric kiln just for efficiency's sake. But other than that, she's practicing all of the traditional methods of construction. And this cornmeal bowl, the, the form, we have one that's almost exactly identical from the 19th century where you have the, the stepped motif along the edges and that's representative of um, the mountaintops that are in the areas where she lives. And then the inclusion of the horn toad and the tadpoles on the, painted on the sides are a reminder of the cyclical nature um, in the way in which people live in these areas. It's very much tied to rainfall, the hopes and prayers for rainfall and for the ongoing fertility of both um, the agriculture and also humanity itself. And so these horn toads and tadpoles are symbolic of the wet season because that's when these creatures appear. And so again, um, something that European Americans didn't necessarily take into account a lot of times was that um, this notion of time for Native people is very much uh, cyclical in nature, whereas even just with the literal title of the word progress, that, that implies this concept of a linear progression of time from beginning, you know, unspoiled, uncivilized, et cetera, to, you know, progress being made in this linear fashion to, um, you know, buildings and organization and categorization, and that's something that Europeans were very keen to do because they do have this concept that time moves in this very linear fashion from beginning to end where most native people don't see time um, in the same way at all. So I think that both the, the formula bowl and the basket are um, good reminders of that as well. And then I wanted to spend um, a few minutes talking about the, the other piece that we've installed in this gallery. And this is a work by Howling Wolf um, or also known as Honanisto. He's a Southern Cheyenne <clears throat> artist. And this ledger drawing came up at auction and we were very keen to acquire it. I had zero ledger drawings in my collection prior to this time. So I asked if I could um, bid on this at auction. And ultimately, um, because of the support of my deputy director, we were able to acquire this and it, it um, became the, I think it set the world record price for a single ledger drawing purchase. So that's a, a kind of interesting fact, um, which isn't specific to the gallery, but it, it's kind of an interesting um, idea that, you know, these, these works have become really sought after really important documents. And I think um, for us, I've seen enough of these drawings and I've, I've kind of kept my eye on these things that this is really, you know, 
I thought if I'm only going to get one, I want to get a really good one. And I feel like we got probably one of the best that I've seen uh, just in terms of um, the size of the piece. It's larger than a lot of pieces. We have the artist um, identified. That is true of about um, half, I think, of the ledger drawings out there. A lot of times we don't have assigned work or we don't have something that we can identify or connect to a specific artist. So this person, this artist, um, specifically is important for a lot of reasons. He is the only artist that we know of, ledger artist, who created works in the pre-reservation, the reservation era, and then after he returned from his imprisonment and went back home, he continued to create art. And so he was, he was renowned not just for um, being an important warrior in his society, but also important for his artistic documentation of Southern Cheyenne culture and history. And so he passed away in 1927, which is, you know, he lived a very long time and he was pretty prolific as an artist. Um, so this work is titled A Southern Cheyenne Ledger Drawing. And um, it's important for a lot of reasons, not just the quality and the size, but also because what we see, and I should backtrack because a lot of you, if you don't know what a, a ledger drawing is, a ledger drawing is something that is essentially just drawn on ledger paper. So these leather bound ledgers that were record keeping in the 19th century, you know, you would keep your accounts or crop, um, I don't know, crop surveys or whatever they would have kept in these ledgers. But for the first time in history, native artists had access to these new materials. So the ledger paper, um, sometimes you'll see entire ledger books that are still bound that are, that are filled with these drawings, but more frequently what you'll see are individual pages that have been removed from those ledgers and then covered over with these drawings. And the artists themselves rarely paid any attention to the, the lines on the paper. So you'll see it, it, it doesn't have any relative, uh, relation to the drawing itself. And sometimes they'll, if there's no draw, no lines on the back of the paper, they might use that. Um, so there's a lot of variation in the paper, but that's essentially where it comes from. So we refer to all of them as ledger drawings. Um, the ledger drawings themselves are predominantly done by male artists. And that is kind of in keeping with this longer, much longer tradition of male arts of the plains where the women, the female artists were generally doing things like beadwork and basketry, focusing on specific motifs or geometric patterning that was very specific to the artist or the community, but was not, um, it didn't serve in terms of a narrative function. It didn't have a biographical story that was being represented. And so with a lot of the Plains men, um, they spent their time painting the exteriors of teepees. Um, they were engaged in rock art. They had shields, all of which were painted with these very specific biographical details about their life. And they were good record keepers. They were good storytellers. And so we have this long tradition of male arts of the Plains that really was very easily translatable into this new format of ledger drawing. And so a lot of these, these guys were already very skilled at, at um, line drawing, um, the use of color. And so this was a pretty easy kind of transition for them. Helen Wolf, I think, really exploited those materials to their fullest too. So um, his life in itself is, is pretty interesting. When he was 15, he um, was engaged in battle at the Sand Creek Massacre. And this was a famous massacre that occurred in Colorado in 1864. And again, he was only 15 years old. So he was fairly young, but got fully exposed to the horrors of warfare. Um, he became with his, his father, Eagle Head, members of the Bowstring Society, which is this warrior society, um, sort of a men's club that would determine um, which battles to be fought, where would they be fought, what would they be fought over. So it was very much a, a kind of high status political appointment to be part of the Bowstring Society. Um, he later, with his father, was considered to be um, essentially an enemy combatant to the, the fledgling American nation. So in 1875, um, Howling Wolf and his father were sent to Fort Marion, which is in St. Augustine, Florida, along with dozens of other male warriors who were deemed kind of dangerous to society. And this was at the time considered this kind of um, almost humane way rather than executing people who had been considered enemies, they simply removed them from their society in an effort to um, deny them their culture, deny them access to their families, hoping that perhaps the families 
would um, be more pliable without their leadership involved. And so um, while it was described as a, a more humane method, I think in a lot of ways, it was much more insidious and, and destructive to the culture itself. So we have all of these men who were put on a train, shipped all the way across the country to St. Augustine, Florida, had never seen the ocean before, had never seen, you know, had never ridden on trains before, were kind of dumped off into this um, kind of a, a, an imprisonment, a camp, but they were under the guidance of this gentleman named Lieutenant Pratt, and he was um, very keen to provide them with the comforts that he saw that they might need, and so he was able to acquire a lot of these art materials. Um, they were essentially given free reign in the town as long as they didn't um, try to, you know, leave. They, they could come and go freely throughout the town, so they were exposed to a lot of different cultures here. Howling Wolf himself had um, some kind of eye condition, a vision problem, and so they put him on a train to Boston. He went up to Boston um, and had some surgery on his eyes, so he was exposed to essentially probably the biggest city he'd ever seen, and, and all of these artists were kind of soaking in these inspirations from um, newspapers, uh, illustrations, and magazines, and signs, you know, in store windows, and so I think that it, it um, may have inspired them further to create these kind of commercial art objects, and these they were free to sell all of these objects too. And then the money that they made from selling these ledger drawings was sent back to their families too. So from a creative perspective, that was kind of a, a positive for an artist, but again, does not nearly um, weigh out in terms of the balance of how much damage was done to their culture. But this ledger drawing itself was created while he was at Fort Marion. And a lot of the, the focus of, of subject matter sort of shifts when you see these artists who are imprisoned, it's much more of a, a documentation of past um, practices and rituals. It's almost like they are sort of desperate to record their history. And so you'll see not so many of the, the warfare and hunting exploits as you did prior to this time. You'll see much more things about um, the way in which meetings were carried out and the way in which romantic encounters were engaged in. And so it it becomes this very important document and, and historical record of life on the plains. And so there, that's another reason that Howling Wolf himself is so important. But um, this one is sort of subtitled A Meeting of the Bowstring Society. And so that is the society, the warrior society in which both um, Howling Wolf and his father were members. And so you can see these four chiefs arriving on horseback. You can see the members um, in the background all probably seated or kneeling with their backs to us. So we see their long um, braided or plated hairstyles. You see the, the curved bow in the middle. So that indicates that this is what we're um, witnessing is, is this particular meeting. And then he also makes little handwritten notes on the drawing. So Roman Nose is a, a famous chief of the day and he's in the lower left with the bird headdress. You can tell that's him. Not just, I mean, if you were a contemporary of his, you would immediately recognize him because of what he's wearing with his regalia, but he's also further identified by Howling Wolf um, in the notations. So there's a whole lot of reasons that this one is just um, an incredible work of art that we're very happy to finally have on display. And um, I couldn't be happier. I'm hoping that we'll get more ledger drawings, but I don't think we'll get better ones. So I think that um, we're pretty pleased with that. Uh, and I have the the sort of happy inclusion on the label also included when we purchased the ledger drawing was a stereograph image of Howling Wolf. So it, to me, it's always fascinating to be able to put a, a face with a name. And so that you can also see on the, um, the label itself. So you get an idea of the man behind um, the magic. So this is an image of Howling Wolf during his time in Florida. Um, and we have even, the image is attributed to a gentleman named O. Pierre Havens, who is an American photographer that I think traveled around the regions and took pictures of um, different individuals that were imprisoned at that time. Um, the other thing I'll point out really quickly, I'll have to go back. Um, what you'll notice, or you may not, when, I, when you go into my galleries specifically, but also in the American gallery, I will identify, if I know the artist, obviously I'm gonna identify them and the culture from which they came. But in some cases, like with this basket, um, I've gone through an, a sort of evolution of the labeling process and come up with a method of labeling that I hope sort of subconsciously highlights the presence of 
a human being behind the creation. And so very typically in, in um, museums, what you might see with this basket would just say Sierra Miwok basket. And so we ultimately landed on the notion of putting artist first and that subconsciously sort of ties the visitor to this idea that it wasn't just a, a culture that made the basket, it was, it was a specific person. And while we may not know her name, we know that she was an artist of Sierra Miwok culture. And so just the shift in um, the wording sometimes in the, the label, I think is really important to kind of keep in mind that we are talking about the human presence and, and human creativity and ingenuity. And um, so that was kind of my subtle way of, of adding more words to the label. But I think that when people have to work a little harder through a label, sometimes it kind of sticks in their mind too. And, and sometimes if we have um, a lot of tribes will, they refer to themselves as something other than what we tend to think of them as. So for example, Navajo refer to themselves as Diné. And so I will put Diné first and then Navajo in parentheses, the term that more people are familiar with, because I also want them to recognize the fact that native people think about their presence and individuality sometimes very differently than the way we've traditionally kind of presented them. So um, it's a, you know, it's sort of chipping away at some of the traditions that are so entrenched in, in museum presentations that I think we're, we're making a little headway. So I think that was my last image. Let me breeze through. <clears throat> yeah, so if you guys have any questions, I can stop sharing. Well, I will say, Joanna, we had somebody comment saying they love the idea that you were just talking about, you know, about giving that you know, it's easy to look at something and forget there's a person behind it, mm -hmm. uh, something like that, especially, and that it is a work of art, you know, it's functional, but again, you know, somebody made that. And I think sometimes with those things, it's easy to kind of just let that bypass you. But I yeah. haven't seen, we've got the chat up. I didn't see another question. Somebody said this was a fat, well, Ellen McCloskey, I'll give you a shout out, Ellen. She said this was a fabulous presentation. So thank so. you. All right. I oh, I think, um, did we get one? No, I just recognize, I think it's Amy. Is it Amy Marshman? Yes, Amy loved the idea. Oh, uh, hi, Amy. Oh, okay. <laughs> I haven't seen her in ages. Okay, I already defined ledger drawing, but if there's any, if you need any clarification. I, just one question. I did want to say, oh, see, there's Amy. Uh, you, uh, did you mention again how, how large the ledger drawing size? Oh, um, that one is. It's about 20 by 14. A, a lot of the ledger drawings are, you know, it could be like, this is my little notebook. Sometimes they're this big. Sometimes they're tiny. Sometimes they're only done in pencil or these very fugitive pigments or inks that don't last. So um, this one is just, it's a miracle. I mean, it, it's everything you would want in a ledger drawing. Howling Wolf did not die in, in captivity. He returned home. He had a long life, children, um, and produced art, you know, all the way up till 1927. Um, I can't remember what year he was born. So that puts him in at like, I think in his seventies. I think he lived into his seventies. So you said um, he was a teenager in like 1864, right? Yeah. So. I'm not good with math. I'm sorry. Art history. I can talk all day math. I'll get my calculator out, but um, he, what, he didn't, he did not die in captivity. And um, by all descriptions of his own um, life in Fort Marion, I mean, as tragic as it was, as, um, you know, I'm sure that there was a lot of mental, it took a mental toll on him, but he also, um, he seemed very content to create these. I mean, he was, he was a, a, a sponge of artistic um, creativity that, you know, I think is, is unique to him as an artist too. So for an artist to be exposed to, and I'm not trying to sugarcoat the captivity part at all, but I think for an artist to be exposed to all of these new ideas and things that were going around him. And they were very savvy marketers too. So um, I don't know if any of you noticed, but in that ledger drawing, there's an American flag that's posted up too. And that's, you know, that's very deliberate. They posted the American flag to, on the one hand symbolize, you know, we are still a warrior society, but we are acquiescing to this new government. But it's also, it's a marketing ploy, you know, like anytime you put an American flag on something, there's gonna be somebody that wants to buy it. So they're, they're very savvy marketers as well. So I think that um, I don't think that anything he did was not deliberate. I think he was an incredibly creative, um, inspired artist, but he also knew how to make art that would sell. So I think, you know, we have to give him credit for that as well. Huh? 
I guess I don't see any other. Well, oh, any books on Howling Wolf? There are. There's a couple. I don't have it. Um, I don't think I have it right here. But there's one woman that devoted her whole like PhD dissertation and her research to Howling Wolf specifically. So I know there's at least one or two. Then there's a lot of essays on him. That work was actually featured in an exhibition, and it's on the cover. I don't have it. I don't think I have it with me, but um, it's on the cover of a catalog for an exhibition that was in Florida. The gentleman that that sold it to us um, lives in Florida, and so he saw our little press release about the ledger drawing and contacted us to tell us how happy he was that it was in a museum and it's going to be seen by a lot of people. So yeah, wonderful. Um, it's a happy happy story for, for us. Yeah, I want a, a wonderful acquisition as well. So yeah. I think then uh, it looks like we've got everybody that's um, posted a question. So 1131, we're doing a great job on time. Right. So, oh, and, and one, Amy Marshman comment. Thanks. It was awesome to see you in here what you've done at the museum. Very enjoyable presentation. Thank you, Amy. All right. I'll take the I appreciate question. it. Thanks, Amy. <laughs> So I, I guess with that, thank you so much, Joanna, for taking the time today to talk to all of us about this. And thank you yeah. all for joining us. Just... Keep an eye out for future 3 and 30 programs. And with that, take care, be well, and have a good day. Thank, thank you, everybody. You. Take care. Bye. Bye-bye.